some marketing campaigns are plain genius. In an instant, we click them or we buy whatever they're selling. And maybe a lot of ads are already coming to mind. Maybe it's Apple's 1984 ad or Nike's Just Do It campaign or this awesome YouTube channel of this company that you now follow and you know that they help you with your pitch decks. But anyway, this is Company Forensics. And today we are going to talk about epic failures because we love epic failures. So in this episode, we'll look at the worst marketing campaigns in history. Let's just dive in. Free pizza for life with a catch. I imagine Domino's marketers. They probably said, there is no way people will do this. After all, this marketing campaign involved permanent body alteration, AKA tattoos. Well, <laughs> it turns out that people don't give a damn about their bodies if there's free pizza, because it's pizza. In 2018, Domino's Russia offered free pizza if consumers tattooed the Domino's logo on their bodies. Now, that's bold, but the campaign didn't end there. Winners would get 100 free pizzas per year for the next 100 years. Not a month, not a year, for 100 years. The campaign started in August 31st, 2018, and Domino's promised to run it for two months. Again, Domino's probably underestimated the immense power of free food. 400 people tattooed themselves with the Domino's logo. Unfortunately, there were so many social network posts that Domino's canceled the promotion after just four days. Instead, they rewarded the first 350 people who'd show the tattoo on Instagram and Twitter, but that left out some. So in the end, Domino agreed to apply the promotion to 381 applicants. Some tattoos were nice, others were less nice, but laughter aside, there's some darkness to this. After the Russian economy had stagnated in 2015, most participants got tattoos because it meant securing food for themselves and their family. So yeah, we can call it a fail, but I mean, some people now have free pizza for life. The campaign went wrong, of course, because everybody wanted in, and I don't think Domino's realized what they were getting into. Anyway, who says I want your music? By the end of the 90s, U2 was pretty much the most popular rock band in the world. In 2000, the band cemented its place with albums like All That You Can Leave Behind and How Does Mantle and Atomic Bomb. I was a big fan of YouTube. I think I'm still am a big fan of YouTube, but I, I don't think I'm allowed to say that on Twitter these days, it appears so. Anyway, YouTube packed stadiums and dominated the charts. Three albums reached platinum levels, so the band took five years to develop a new one. Still, U2 believed that after half a decade, they were still as relevant as always. Even Bono said that part of being an artist has a bit of megalomania. So what was the plan? Well, U2 partnered with Apple, you probably remember this, to do something special. Rumors spread that it would be a live performance at the Apple event, or that a new album would be available in special edition iPods. Something along those lines, which was, I mean, it was partly true. U2 did take the stage, they performed one song, and then Tim Cook said, Is, he said, isn't that the greatest you've ever heard? Which is a ballsy statement, even for Apple. And then Bono announced that they, they wanted their music to reach everyone. So that's what they did. The new U2 album, Songs of Innocence, was gonna be in every iTunes account and people hated the idea. People lashed that at both Apple and the band from Privacy Intrusion and hey, saying like, hey, I don't even listen to U2. And U2 was now the world's most hated band. And in a matter of days, Apple released a guide on how to remove the album. And a month later, Bono had to apologize. The total cost was $100 million and a few jobs, I'm pretty sure. The lesson is sometimes celebrities and marketing campaigns don't work as well. She's no savior. So let's start at the end. Here's what Pepsi ended up saying. Pepsi was trying to project a global message of unity, peace, and understanding. Clearly, we missed the mark and apologize. So why was the soda giant apologizing? Because of one ad. Young people, all holding signs, all attractive, protest in front of a police line. It's this peaceful scene and there's no violence. Right around the corner, Kendall Jenner is finishing a photo shoot. She steps out of the shoot, rubs off her makeup, and takes a Pepsi can. She parts the crowd like a modern day savior and faces a good looking police officer. And then she gives them a Pepsi can. He smiles, then drinks it and everybody's happy, except nobody's happy. The world was pissed at this, but why? Well, times weren't easy in the US in 2017. You had political turmoil, racial issues, Black Lives Matter protests, and so on. So any campaign that dealt with these issues had to treat it very lightly and Pepsi didn't. They stumped their way to complete controversy immediately. And we're talking in a matter of hours, backlash flooded Pepsi. Even the daughter of Martin Luther King said the ad mocked the civil rights movements. And then people complained about Kendall Jenner. If the woman would have been black in real life, I guess it would have 
ended up in the news for all the wrong reasons. Anyway, the backlash was such that this ad only ran for a day before Pepsi had to pull it out of circulation and apologize, which has got to be a record. Don't trust your product too much. LifeLock is a security company that prides itself in security. Yes, you might love your product, but sometimes you can love it a little bit too much. So in 2007, LifeLock felt so proud of its product that it launched one of the most courageous and stupid marketing campaigns in history. The CEO, the then CEO and co-founder Todd Davis created a campaign that if it worked, I mean, it could have been genius, but if it didn't, it would be just stupid. Davis went on every media outlet from TV ads to billboards to the internet and reveal, revealed his social security number. The idea was no one could hack his account or steal his identity. That's how confident he was in LifeLock. And yeah, that's not what you want hackers to hear. Challenge accepted. No. From 2007 to 2008, hackers used his identity not once, but 13 times. If that wasn't enough, the Federal Trade Commission sued LifeLock for $100 million for false advertising. At least the story has a happy ending. In 2017, Simon Tech brought the company for $2.3 billion and maybe they ditched the marketing team. But light up for whatever. Now, playing ping pong with Arnold Schwarzenegger sounds, I mean, sounds pretty cool, right? Now, in 2014, Bud Light released its Up For Whatever campaign, and it seemed great. It was lighthearted, spontaneous, and carefree. The ads were simple and efficient. And first, someone had to say, yes, I'm up for whatever. And then you want to take a Bud Light and brace for literally whatever. And Bud Light bottles had 140 sentences, and one of them read, the perfect beer for removing no from your vocabulary. And at first, it seemed innocent enough. It, of course, was referring to partying or just having a good time. Until you read between the lines, and people took no time in doing so. The removing no from your vocabulary phrase immediately sparked controversy. Of course, there was an instant association with date rape and the lack of consent. Hashtag up for whatever started circulating and going viral, but for all the wrong reasons, not for broad light. So Bud Light apologized and dropped that line from the 140 lines in beer bottles. In the end, analysts disagree on whether it was a blunder or a high risk, high reward move. It's up for people to say, so it's up for you guys to say, I guess, in the comments. But taking such a risk is valid only if you really understand your company. And that's where our sponsor, Chert Mogul, comes in. We've been using their tool for over five years to track the performance of our SaaS business. And if you haven't already, I really recommend that you watch the videos that we've produced in partnership with them. Uh, we have a new video on the ROI of tech conferences where we got to hang out with their team a little bit, uh, but also one on SaaS metrics, which kind of gives you a whole overview of how SaaS metrics works churn and you know why churn can be deadly for a SaaS business. Thankfully, a tool like Mogul can save your business from churn and from startup cancer by providing you with incredibly valuable insights about customer churn so that you can quickly reduce it by addressing the root of the issue. Also, Mogul is free for any company with under $10,000 in MRR. Uh, you also get a $50 credit if you go over 10K MRR. If you use the code in the description, URL is chartmogul.com slash sliping. Thanks again to the Mogul guys for sponsoring our videos this year. Next story, on the edge of bankruptcy. Back in 2003, Red Lobster president Edna Morris had to step down from her position after less than a year on the job. And she left her position with a lack of satisfaction as she felt she couldn't fulfill all her goals. She also left the company in dire straits. Many wonder if Red Lobster would just go bankrupt and it was all because of crabs. Morris launched an endless snow crab promotion for $29.99. Now that's not cheap for an all you can eat, but if it's snow crab, it's really cheap. So the promotion was a hit, which was good news for the restaurant, right? Well, no, because at the time, the snow crab price was going up as the US government implemented quotas to help preserve the species. So the price of crab skyrocketed. And that's not the only factor. People love snow crab. So expensive products and a lot of customers, that's just a recipe for disaster. Red Lobster lost so much money with that promotion that it sparkled a stock sell-off once word got out. In a single trading session, the parent stock, Darden Restaurants, lost $406 million, which has to hurt, of course. But the examples get even worse, way worse. Next up, this is total crap. Have you ever heard of Ratner Group? It's okay if you haven't. I hadn't heard about them before I read this script. <laughs> But to understand why, we need to go back in history. The Ratner Group was this jewelry distributor that flourished in the UK after an aggressive expansion during the 80s. 
and the brand became a hit for its cheap items and plenty of stores. Though jewelry gained a reputation for being somewhat tacky, Ratner was extremely popular. At one point, it ended up being one of the UK's biggest businesses. That is until CEO Gerald Ratner took to the stage in 1991. Now, Ratner was part of the family and in charge of growing the Ratner Group from 130 stores to 2,500, making it a powerhouse in the market. So he had earned some respect. And then this happened. People say to me, how can you sell this for such a low price? I say because it's total crap. <laughs> now let's give him some credit. The entire skit is, I mean, it's quite funny, but he's not a comedian. So when the CEO trashes the product, it's not great for the business. After his little rant about selling crap, the company lost 500 million British pounds. From 92 to 94, the company closed 300 stores. And by November 92, Gerald Ratner had resigned. Took him long enough. The company even had to change names to the Signet Group to avoid further losses. So don't call your product crap. Just, just don't. <laughs> and granted, this one isn't a marketing campaign, but it is so funny, you, you just have to talk about it. Now let's close the story with a marketing fail legend, or maybe a win. Out with the old, in with the new. The 80s were an interesting time for food and beverage. Older consumers wanted healthier products. The younger audience, <laughs> the younger audience wanted something with a bit more flair. So trends were changing and not even giant Coca-Cola could escape a changing horizon. So Coca-Cola had lost some ground against the newcomer Pepsi, especially with the younger crowd. Now, Coca-Cola was selling a lot of Diet Coke, which was a hit with the older audiences. Also, it introduced Cherry Coke, which was a specialty, but successful altogether. So while it grew, Coca-Cola was also losing market share in the full sugar cola department. Now in 86, Roberto Goizueta, the controversial CEO, came up with an idea to create a brand new product. He decided to tweak the recipe to improve taste and to lure in more customers. And he was using evidence from case studies in the Bahamas and taste tests in the US. They showed that clients would accept a newer, bolder flavor. And so new Coke entered the market. Goizueta was so confident that he assured the public that the new product would be an instant hit. But there's only one problem. People are sensitive about their Coke. More so in the South, which is also one of its biggest markets. Coca-Cola, right? Not, not the other. But that was one of Coca-Cola's mistakes. The company pushed new Coke in states like New York and Washington DC. It handed cans to workers and even started selling the new Coke in McDonald's. So in those areas, sales did go up. But in the South, numbers did the opposite. Fans lashed out. Changing the recipe was betraying tradition and selling out to the Yankees in the North. Pepsi, by the way, had its base in New York City, which was common. Coca-Cola's hotline, 1-800-GET-COKE, got 1,500 calls a day from angry customers. People even went to shrinks to deal with this issue. So yes, you don't mess with Coke fans. One man even filed a class action lawsuit, but it didn't get anywhere. The legend goes that the judge was a Pepsi guy, so it just didn't go far. Pepsi, of course, preyed on this and blasted Coca-Cola in its ads. Things were so tense at some point that even if New Coke was selling well in some states, executives at the company were just nervous. So on July 11th, 1985, two months and 29 days after New Coke entered the market, Coca-Cola decided to reintroduce the classic recipe. And the US Senate called it a significant moment in US history. The old recipe entered as Coca-Cola Classic and New Coke survived as Coke for seven more years. Now, for the conspiracy part, Coca-Cola Classic sales did spike after the reintroduction. Sales in general bounced back, the stock increased, and Coca-Cola's market share went up, never to drop. Also, no one lost their jobs, and Coca-Cola has claimed that it took them a long time to understand why they failed. So perhaps it was all an evil plan, which would have been genius. I just don't know. Um, now, what are some marketing fails that have blown your mind? If you want to leave them in the comments, we might make another video about them.